All right, cool. Good morning, everyone. My name is Trent Bayer. Um, this is recognition, and thank you all for being here today. So a little bit, a little bit about me before we get started. I'm a current senior here at Grand High School. I'm involved in clubs like TSA, FBLA, and NHS. Um, by the end of this year, I'll have 13 AP credits, including AP CSP and CompSci A, which are great foundation classes for this course. I'm also in Cybersecurity 1 and 2 at CCIC, and in my future, I'm looking towards computer science as I have committed to CU Boulder for computer science. So next, I want to talk about my advisors, the people that helped me with this project, and thank them for everything. I have two expert advisors and four support advisors. My first expert advisor is Dr. Diaz Guru. He is, a, he is the chairman and, prof and a professor at the University of Mysore in India. He has a PhD in computer science. He has completed postdoctoral work in computer science at Michigan State University, and he specializes in pattern recognition and image processing. My second expert advisor is Dr. Bapu Kiranagi. He's a past student of Dr. Diaz Guru. He's a concurrent employee at Stratvision. Uh, he specializes in AI and pattern recognition, specifically with autonomous vehicles, and he's currently living in Michigan. That made contact with him a little bit easier. And for my four support advisors, uh, they're Wesley Walker, Parker Gus, Dylan Gross, and Rudra Goel. They were all students in my STEM projects class. They were a huge help. They made sure to, you know, whenever I had a question or just needed something to be reviewed, they were there to help me out. Next, I want to kind of tell the story behind this project, what inspired me. So it was October. October count day had come around. It was time for teachers to take positive attendance. And I was sitting in my physics class, and the phone in the back started to ring. Um, a teacher went and picked it up, and it was administration telling her that she needed to take positive attendance. And at the same time, in my STEM projects class, I was struggling to figure out what I was going to do. So after having that experience, I decided that I would create recognition. And basically, what it is, is automatic attendance using advanced facial recognition and neural networks. And for this project, I had to write a neural network code base, a database. I had to interpret data and use it to take attendance and then take that attendance data and make it easy to understand for teachers. Next, I want to talk about my objectives for this project. First was the timeline. I wanted to make sure that I had a strict timeline that I was sticking to. Next is procrastination. I wanted to make sure that I was working every single day, getting somewhere every single day and wasn't slacking off. Next was programming. I wanted to make sure that I was improving my skills in Python as it is a common language, especially for data science. And since I'm moving in the computer science direction, I wanted to be ready for that. Uh, and then for electronics, I thought it was really interesting, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about electronics and microcontrollers, um, as they are a huge part of mechanics and combining computer science with mechanics. So I wanted to understand how those work. And then I also wanted to learn skills in data science and machine learning for the future. Um, next is the logo. So I have a few different logos here. The first top one, uh, uses spatial structure and binary. And the reason I chose that is because my project is all about facial recognition. And that involves a lot of code. And so by splitting the face with binary and facial structure, I'm able to show how the code is basically taking the facial structure and converting it into binary code that it can understand. Next, I've put brackets around the word cognition. The reason I did this is because cognition is basically the usage of one's brain and thinking and a neural network is based off of the human brain. So by putting the brackets around cognition, that was basically representing what a neural network is. And then recognition obviously just comes from facial recognition. For the color palette, I chose this nice blue, a white, and a slight off-white color. Um, it's innovative and professional, and it's also really comforting. And the reason that I feel that's important is because when people think AI and machine learning nowadays, they get super nervous. They're like, they're stealing all of our data. So I wanted to choose something that makes you feel a little bit comfortable. And the last part is the variations. As you see, there's a few different versions of this logo. And the reason I did that is, let's say you're sending an email, and rather than having that full logo, you just want your title. But you still want to have a little bit of color and still pop with your business and how it looks. That's what those variations are for. Next, I want to talk about my timeline. Initially, I had a timeline. I was pretty confident that's how it was going to work out. I quickly found out that that wasn't going to happen. But this is my initial timeline. My first phase was six weeks of research. I thought I would get it all done in those six weeks. That was not true. Phase two was facial recognition. Um, for one week, I was like, I'll just install cameras, make sure those cameras are transmitting data to a microcontroller. 
and then also write some basic facial recognition code where it's just like face the straw square around that. My third phase was the neural network phase. Um, for six weeks, I was going to write a neural network code base, combine it with my facial recognition code, and then create a, create a database and do back propagation to train that neural network. Phase four was integration and testing, where I would basically combine the code with live camera data and test with students in the class, and I gave myself four weeks to do this. And then my fifth phase was for two weeks, it would just be complete the presentation and get ready to present. That changed pretty quickly, and so this is my final timeline. Went from five phases to six phases. My first phase was for four weeks of just plain neural network research. I had to understand the basis of this entire project before I could get into coding the project because there wouldn't be a point in me just writing some code if I didn't understand what I was doing. Phase two was programming. For six weeks, including winter break, I basically wrote four basic Python scripts, which at the time were capable of recognizing, and then I added on more features to that. Phase three was three weeks long, and it was my microcontroller phase. During this time, I researched microcontrollers, chose a microcontroller, and integrated and tested my code with that microcontroller. Phase four was four weeks long. It was my database phase. I wrote code to integrate the database and interpret it. Um, phase five was the future phase, and basically I took that time to just think about what I can do with this project as I take it forward into college and beyond. And phase six was presentation. For two weeks, I just worked on my presentation, my final journal, and as, uh, as well as my trifold. So now I want to start talking about the actual product, the actual project, and what it does. Um, and starting with the neural network. So 3Blue1Brown is this YouTuber. He makes a bunch of math and science videos. And he's basically like the god of this project. When my code started breaking, he was the one that I was praying to. And he had a YouTube uh, series of about four videos. And those four videos taught me basic neural network structure, what weights and biases do within a neural network, as well as the concept behind training and backpropagation. He also explained what the cost function is and why it has a sigmoid fit, which is a linear algebra uh, algorithm, and also some multivariable calculus methods that have to be used to calculate the weights and biases and write the cost function. I would love to go a lot more in detail on this neural network stuff, but that would require like another hour and a half of explanation. So if you guys want some more explanation or understanding of that, my table and my journal have all that information. Next I want to talk about my database. So for my database, I use MySQL, which is a database creation tool. And the first thing I had to do was understand the creation and management tool that is available through MySQL, which is called MySQL Workbench. Once I understood Workbench, I also figured out that I would under have to understand the MySQL command prompt. And that's what you can see right there. That black box with all of that weird looking white stuff is the command prompt for MySQL. And that's what I used to basically understand what was going on inside of my database, uh, what the tables looked like if all of my data was being held properly. And then another part of my database research and uh, work that I had to do for it was integration into Python. I had to take all that database stuff and put it into Python so that I could just run everything in one place. Because I can't just put my school uh, queries and code just into Python and hope it works. So I had to research what libraries I had to import and how I had to do the syntax using things like insert, create, update, select, and where, which are some uh, functions within MySQL to make sure that um, the database would function properly within Python. One example of that syntax is how select and where work together. Um, and I use that in my code to select the attendance values for specific user IDs. So I would say select the attendance value for a user ID where that user ID is equal to a specific value. And then finally, I had to understand how to parse through a MySQL database. Because if I wanted to make the uh, data easy to read and understand, I had to parse through it and put it in something like a spreadsheet, which is what I ended up doing. Um, so that was another thing that I had to research. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the hardware, which is just the microcontroller. The first thing I had to decide was what microcontroller I was going to use. I was between an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi. I quickly found that the Arduino wasn't going to work, as the MicroPython uh, function that is on Arduino wasn't going to work with the Arduino I had. So I settled on the Raspberry Pi. Once I did that, I created a GitHub so I could easily access my code on the Raspberry Pi, put the code onto the Raspberry Pi, ran it, and tested it. And here is a quick video of that. 
So as you can see, it's able to detect my face. It knows that it's there. It's drawing a rectangle around it. But it's definitely really slow. And I'll talk about that struggle a little bit later in my struggle section. Uh, but now we're going to move on to the software. This is the meat of the project. This is really where the project became the project. And the very first thing I had to understand was OpenCV. OpenCV is a library within Python which makes uh, facial recognition and pattern recognition a lot easier. Rather than having to write the neural network and all the numbers and do all the math manually, OpenCV helps you do it yourself. And usually how facial recognition works is you go through each pixel of a, an image, such as an image of a face, and you try to see if that image has attributes that would make it a face, such as changes in color or uh, changes in tone, shadows, things like that. You look for those things. But that takes a lot of time and it's really inefficient. So OpenCV uses something called cascades. Basically what cascades do is they chunk the data into sections of pixels and then they take those pixels and see if any of those pixels could be a face. So it runs through those pixels really fast um, and really inaccurately and it sees if there are any outliers. If it sees outliers, it chunks all the outliers together and then checks once again on those, but more specifically. And so by doing this and doing it again and again and again, the iterative process basically makes it so that it's going to be really accurate at finding all the pixels where faces are present while also making sure that it's fast and effective. So after understanding that, I researched and understood I would have to write six unique scripts. The very first one is the video script. It's just basic facial recognition. All it does is takes the cascade, runs it over a live camera feed, and when it runs it over that live camera feed, any faces that it detects, it uh, throws some boxes around those. If you guys want to see how that works or want a demonstration of that, come to my table, I have it up there. Um, then my next script was the collection, uh, collection script. This basically takes in a bunch of pictures that are going to be used to create training data. It matches those images to specific user IDs that are inputted by the user, and it also creates the database. Now, the reason that I created the database here, as well as having the unique user IDs, was to make sure that when someone is inputting um, their user ID and name for their pictures, they're not trying to cheat the system a little bit. Um, so if, let's say, you put in your user ID and then try to put in someone else's name, this will basically prevent you from doing that. As the user ID is a primary key, there won't be any repeats. So whatever you input the very first time, that's what's going to be registered to that user ID to make sure that there's no one trying to mess with the system and trying to make it so that one user ID houses multiple people. The next script is the training script. This basically just takes all of those images and based on the user IDs, it basically trains a neural network to be able to detect those faces. So let's say there's five faces uh, that I've taken 500 pictures for each. This will basically go through all of those pictures and it'll create training data, which is just a bunch of numbers, and it'll put all of that together in a file. Next was the recognition script. This combines everything that I've talked to so talked about so far. Um, it creates a live window, and in this feed, it draws squares around people's faces. Um, it's also able to take that training data created using the collection and training scripts and say if a person is detected or not as a specific user. So let's say Ruger, for example. Um, if I have him trained into my code, um, what it'll do is, if it sees him, it'll say, okay, he's there, let me change the attendance value. If not, it won't do anything, and it'll say, sorry, I couldn't recognize you. The next script is the conversion script. It basically takes all the stuff that's in the database, all the attendance values, all the user IDs, and it parses through all of it and creates a spreadsheet so that it's a lot easier for teachers to see um, and just understand who is in class and who isn't in class. And then finally is the database script, and it basically allowed for easier creation and control and manipulation of my MySQL database as it created methods such as execute query and create connection, which would make it a lot easier in separate Python files to manipulate my MySQL database. So after understanding all of this, I wrote just a little bit of code. Um, and one pattern you might see here is there's a lot of these orange numbers all over, and that's basically training data. One fun little fact, uh, the training data for my code that I have right now has five faces, each with 500 photos each, and it goes on for over 3.1 million lines. So here's a quick demonstration of how it actually works. As you can see at the beginning, all the attendance values are set to zero. I go to my recognition script, let it run. It takes a few seconds, runs a few calculations.
<laughs> Brings up this window, and as you can see, it's able to detect me. It says I'm a person, I have a face. Then there's Rudra, detects him. It's able to see that he's there. And then he's also going to take off his glasses. And once he takes that off, even though there's a, a pretty major physical change that's happening in that video, you're able to tell that it's still Rudra. The code is still able to detect that. And so after that, as you can see right there, the attendance values have switched to 1 for me, Rudra. From there, I go to the conversion script. I run it. And it's going to create a spreadsheet. And when I go to the spreadsheet, you'll be able to see that there you go. For me and for Rudra, it says present, and for everyone else, the attendance value is absent. So that's like basically the project. That's how it works and it functions. But it wasn't just that easy. There was obviously some struggles along the way. And so these are the four big main struggles I had. The first one was OpenCV installation. At the very beginning, when I started writing my code, I was planning on using an IDE called Spider. And to install OpenCV for that, um, I had to have a specific command prompt. First problem I ran into, students aren't allowed to use command prompt. So then I had to uh, have Mr. Combs help me with on the administrator side and allow me to use an administrator account, uh, his account. And once I used that, I was able to access the command prompt. Then I ran into another problem. This command prompt had to be at a very specific path in the uh, directory of files to make sure that when OpenCV was installed, it was installed in the right place to be accessed by my code. So then I was like, let me make this easy on myself. And so I moved from Spider to Visual Studio Code. And when I moved to Visual Studio Code, I was more easily able to install OpenCV. The next issue I want to talk about is database in integration and manipulation. Um, I struggled with this a lot because I've never worked with MySQL or databases in any way. So just understanding the syntax um, and working with errors that were that just kept coming up, whether it was the code isn't running or the database isn't accepting data, I, I kept running into issues like that. And so I had to work through those issues, and that was another struggle that I had along the way. And then the last two both involved microcontrollers. At first, I was planning on using Arduino. They're powerful, they're small, I thought it would make a lot of sense for my project. Uh, but the Arduino that I had in my possession, I quickly found out that it's not able to use MicroPython like I was mentioning earlier. MicroPython is basically a method or function within Arduino that allows you to run Python code on an Arduino. And so since I wasn't able to do that, I moved to the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi also gave me a lot of issue. I thought this would take like a week, it took me like three or four weeks because of how many problems I had. And the first problem I had was connecting to Wi-Fi. Um, usually the Raspberry Pi, you have to like manually encode the uh, Wi-Fi into it and then directly connect to a router. But the problem with the school routers is that they cannot be connected to using Secure Shell. You can't just say, I want to connect to this, I'm just going to connect to it, as they don't accept incoming requests. So since I had that problem, I had to figure out a way to enable just regular Wi-Fi on the Raspberry Pi just using it like a computer, where you just click that little Wi-Fi symbol and then connect to a Wi-Fi. And so once I created that setting in the configuration, I was able to access the Wi-Fi. And then on top of that, like I showed earlier, it was really, really slow. When I was trying to run my code on it, which is pretty heavy code, it was struggling a lot. And so I found that the reason for this is actually because the RAM or the amount of memory that's within the Raspberry Pi is really low. It only has about two gigabytes when it needs around eight to run effectively. So that leads me to my next slide where I talk about the future, what I'm gonna do next. And the first thing I wanna do is build my own custom microcontroller. I wanted to have the processing power and memory power to be able to run my code effectively and fast. And a microcontroller will also provide that mobility so that teachers can place the camera and all the technology wherever it, it makes sense to them for their classroom. The next possibility is the time function. The time function in Python basically allows you to track how much time has passed. And what this would allow is for my code to detect if students are on time or tardy. So right now, if it detects anyone, it'll say they're present. However, you obviously want to be able to say if they're tardy or not, and the time function would allow that. The next would be a custom GUI. Uh, GUI basically stands for Graphical User Interface, and what that will allow me to do is users, such as teachers, would be able to easily look through all the data, see, okay, these students are present, these students are not. It would basically be like PowerSchool, but for my code. Next is teacher control. 
Certain teachers, they're okay with their students showing up a little late. Some aren't. And so by giving teachers that control, they'd be able to say, hey, um, I'm okay with students showing up a little late, let me change the tardy value. Or I, I want my students to be on time, let me change the tardy value. And so by giving teachers that control, it doesn't take everything away um, in that area. It doesn't take all of the attendance um, control and just give it to one little piece of code. And the final part of the future would be AI simulation. This is the one I'm most excited about. And so basically what this is, is right now, if I want to train my code to be able to detect people with hats or if they're wearing masks or anything like that, I would have to take exponentially more pictures. Like right now, I have to take around 500 for my code to be 60 to 70% accurate. If I wanted to get it to be 60 to 70% accurate with masks and hats, I would have to take uh, at least 5,000 pictures for each. I don't want to have to do that. And so what I would rather do is AI simulation. And what this is, is simulating masks and hats onto images that have already been taken. This allows fewer pictures to be taken, and by creating these simulations and creating training data for those simulations, you can basically prevent uh, the usage of lots and lots of pictures and taking up too much room on desktops or hard drives. So yeah, that's my project. As the sources roll by, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to my advisors, and thank you to Mr. Combs for teaching this class and helping us with everything that we needed help with. And so yeah, if there are any questions, I'll take them right now. Do you have any questions? Casey? So does this mean that on picture day, instead of taking one photo, we have to take 500? Okay, so that's the thing. So right now I only have five people, right, in my um, database. If I add more people, it would require fewer pictures. So in the school during uh, picture day, if I was training this on picture day, I would have to take five photos of each person because there's thousands of people in the school. And so as, as more people get added, it, it's able to detect uniqueness between people more and more accurately. Great. Um, how long does it take to, for the computer to train each face? Um, for each face, it takes about, so right now with the 500 pictures that I did, mm -hmm. for each face it takes about 10 to 15 seconds. Wow. Ty? You mentioned that you used MySQL. What was the reasoning behind that? Because MySQL, like you mentioned, there's the command prompt, there's all these moving layers. Was there a reason you chose that as opposed to something a bit more lightweight, like just S, like SQL3? It was free, and I just, that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, I want to use this. Um, my research that I had done at the beginning of the year and like during winter break was all in my SQL. I had seen some stuff about SQL3 and things like that, but I was like, I know a little bit more about my SQL, so that's why I stuck with that. Fair enough. I think it's free is the best answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> other questions? Are there any other questions? I do. Okay. Uh, so is the confidence of your neural network, is it just purely based on how many photos you take? Um, it's, it's like a combination of how many photos there are and how many people there are. So in currently right now, the number of people in the code is really low. There's only five, like I was saying. Um, so I have to take way more pictures to get that confidence value up. But as you start adding more and more people, the confidence value will go up naturally. And you'll start having to take fewer and fewer pictures. Any other questions?